Hey, so, uh, are there any pieces of media you feel weirdly attracted to? Like, not necessarily for sentimental reasons or how much you enjoy them, but more so just, you know, you can't forget them due to some specific thing they did for you, like helping you discover your sexuality, or a fear you didn't know you had, or how to safely dissolve a body in hydrochloric acid, that sort of thing. The stuff that gives you such valuable info about yourself, you can never quite remove it from your person whether you want to or not. Like, it's almost a part of you you can never get rid of. Anyway, for me, that thing is a Canadian cartoon called Wayside, and the reason I can't get it out of my head is because it was the first thing I ever saw that I hated so much, I just had to analyze it. Yeah, that's right. This was the thing that sparked my interest in making reviews. When I was 10 years old, I saw its pilot movie in school, excited hearing it was based on my favorite book series of all time, and it ended up being so bad to my prepubescent self, I couldn't help but write down my thoughts to literally no one. That's how angry this thing made me as a fan of the original books. Oh, but hold on, you probably don't know what those are to begin with, do you? Okay, s sorry. <clears throat> okay, so for those who don't know what a wayside is, Sideways Stories from Wayside School is this really old series of chapter books written by Lewis Socker, who's probably better known now for holes, but back during the pre-internet age I didn't live in, these three, now four, books were more or less his claim to fame. And when I was a kid, I was absolutely obsessed with them. They were some of my favorite things in the world. And the only thing that kept me from reading them all the time was how consistently other kids had them checked out. They were the sort of books you had to get when they were in stock at the library, since if you didn't do it quick enough, someone else was gonna snatch them. They were hot shit. And looking back after rereading them for nostalgia recently, I gotta say, it's pretty obvious why. These things were basically all you could want from a book as a kid. They were funny, creative, smart, weird, dark, and with such a unique premise as being about a one-story school that accidentally got built on its side to be 30 stories with one classroom per floor, it was wasn't a series you could mistake for anything else. There was a very distinct essence and humor to Wayside that was instantly recognizably its own, and so being that I was such a huge fan who'd read them over and over for literal years on end at that point, I was super excited to watch the movie, as I'd always wanted to see what the book's weird-ass visuals would look like outside of the charming but static illustrations I was so used to. Like, sorry Adam McCauley, your drawings were cool and all, but my little ADHD-riddled brain needed some movement aside from the action of turning the page, and this movie seemed like exactly what I was looking for. I already knew it existed because of those annoying blurbs every book gets once they receive an adaptation, but I never had the chance to see it myself, so you better believe that when I was trapped inside during a tornado warning, since it was Oklahoma where every day is a tornado warning, and heard we were watching the pilot movie to pass the time, I was ecstatic. At long last, after years of constantly reading the same thing, I was gonna see it in motion for the first time, and whoa man would you look at that. It wasn't anything like the books at all. It was just bad. So bad, in fact, that even a 10-year-old could tell you it sucked every kind of balls there were. And thus, my obsession with analyzing media had begun. In a way, you could even say it was the start of me becoming what I am now. So if I'd never watched Wayside and come to hate it as much as I did, I might not have grown up to be the majestic stallion you see before you today. For real though, in terms of me building taste and figuring out how much I love doing all of this, that shitty film was sort of integral to my development, and so while I never gave it another chance or watched the show proper after that film, it has always held a special place in my mind for how it changed me. I've never been able to really forget about it, and hey, what do you know? I recently found out the whole thing's on YouTube in high quality with ungodly high view counts, holy shit! The numbers on that pilot movie alone are almost the same as the total views of my whole channel, Jesus Christ. Is the Wayside series fandom really that big? Reddit would seem to disagree, I see way more posts about the book than I do the show. Show, but eh, then again, I guess a lot of the viewer base for this probably wouldn't know how to use Reddit anyway. Shit, I don't even know how to use Reddit. Why am I on here? Point is, I reread all the books and this thing's been on my mind nonstop and apparently there's a new market for it online and it's all easily accessible for viewing, so I figured there's no better time to finally see what I was missing and wow, it is way worse than I expected. My younger self definitely made the right call not looking for more. No joke, this might be one of the worst adaptations and cartoons period I've seen in a while. It's not just your average everyday bad, this is advanced garbage. And I can't stand the thought of it being what people think Wayside is when the books are so great. So I'm gonna do what I should've done a long time ago and break it down here. Cause Wayside is a garbage show and a worse adaptation. 
here's why. Or at least I would say here's why, but it's not quite that simple. See, unlike a lot of short-lived shows where there's a consistent baseline of quality I can use to judge it by, Wayside's a little special in that, while technically it does have flaws that stay virtually the same for its two seasons and 52 episodes, it's also got around four eras where I'd say, intentionally or not, it shakes up the status quo and becomes something slightly different with a whole new range of problems. Yeah, when I said this show was advanced garbage, that wasn't just YouTuber click bait speak. I was being dead serious. It's been a fucking nightmare trying to lay this all out, but now that I've spent way too long taking way too many notes for a series that's this simple, I think I've finally got it all sorted. And so for this video, I'm gonna start from that original 2005 pilot film, then move on to the first season of the 2007 show, then a super small gap going from episodes 14 to 16, yes it's important enough for its own section, and finally to round it all out, I'll talk about the last 10 episodes comprising the rest of season two. There's no way for me to talk about why this sucks without cutting it up and working my way down, so let's start by going way back to where it all began for me with the 2005 Wayside pilot movie, otherwise known as Wayside the Movie. Creative name. But before getting to that, first I want to tell you about this video's sponsor, Honeygain, a simple-to-use passive income app that helps you make a little extra cash just by letting it run in the background on your devices. How does that work? Well, basically all it does is take your unused internet bandwidth and, through safely encrypted traffic, lets verified businesses use the public data it offers to do things like check if ads they made are working properly. It's all very innocent stuff that doesn't intrude on your privacy, so there's no risk involved, and for letting them do it by running the app on whatever device you choose, and as many as you want, which can give way bigger rewards, you can earn a little cash to do it. Now, this isn't going to be a lot of money by any stretch, but with time, again, by doing nothing, you could use it to pay for streaming services or other minor purchases. And if you want, you can make even more by referring friends, which gets you a 25% bonus from the traffic they share. And that's just one of the many perks it offers. It's got loads of ways to save, and you can start earning right now by clicking my link in the description and signing up with the code Just Stop to get $3 instantly towards your savings. Thanks to Honeygain for sponsoring, and on with the video. Alright, so I'm not gonna lie, I'm very tempted to just start wailing on this movie right out of the gate for all the pent-up anger I've got at it, but before getting into it properly and tearing it a new asshole, I feel like first things first, I should give some more details on what the books are about, since I don't think you'll quite appreciate just how obviously flawed this is as a pitch for an adaptation until you really understand all that's been lost. Like, I kept the premise short at first just to stay on topic, so it might have sounded a little basic when I was explaining it before, but trust me, these books have a very specific narrative style and presentation that makes them what they are. The idea is not anywhere close to being as simple as just le wacky school. As much as this film's gonna make you think it is. Really, if anything, the book's actual focus is more along the lines of le wacky class, seeing as we're following the strange antics and backwards logic of the students making up Mrs. Jewel's class on the top 30th floor. Uh, how many students are there, you ask? Eight? 10, 12, uh, yeah, you're kinda close. Try 28. Yes, really. We follow 28 students at Wayside on the regular from book to book. And you wanna guess what the craziest thing about that is? Cause it's not the quantity, it's the quality. Since for one thing, these kids all have such distinguished personalities, you'll never confuse one for another. And secondly, just in general, as far as child characters go, they also feel so naturally genuine. Like when it comes to their mannerisms, quirks, the way they ask questions and find solutions and can't seem to put certain things together, Together, it's way too realistic. You can tell Sockers worked with children by how he writes them. It's very palpable in how complex they all feel as characters. And the fact he's able to bring that complexity to 28 unique, fun students, that's some real skill. Not just anybody can do that, and Sokker knew just as well as anyone what great characters they all were. That's why instead of having a consistent main character, he lets a new one take over every chapter. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention? These books are anthologies. Their whole format's based on telling creative little stories that highlight the weirdness of the caster world, and my god does it work for what Sokka's doing. It's like a perfect way of ensuring everyone in the class gets a spotlight. Nobody's left out, and when the characters are all as great as they are here, that's only a positive. It's just taking full advantage of the cast it's got to use them as much as possible, and hey, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? <sighs> Okay, so having established that the characters are one of the most important aspects of Wayside as a series, basically foundational, let me ask you something preemptively here. How many of those 28 original students do you think have an effect on the pilot movie's plots? Or, better yet, better yet, I'll make it easier. How many do you think have more than one line of dialogue in the whole thing? I'm not even talking main characters here, just how many kids in Mrs. Jewel's class do you think say more than one thing? Because I'll tell you. 
it's four. Four of the now 16 or so students who make up the class in this get more than one spoken line in the whole movie. I say 16 or so because only about eight or nine of them are actually named. And of those four students who get more than a single line of dialogue, only one actually matters to the main plot. Oh boy, this is already going down in flames. And okay, look, I want to make it clear. I'm not against the idea of having a main character for this story. It's not like I was expecting everyone to get an equal part. That's not the problem here. The problem is that as a pilot, this is supposed to introduce us to what the series is about, which should be the weirdness and variety of Mrs. Jewel's class, yet it completely excludes three-fourths of them from having any level of importance. Like, how are you gonna make a movie called Wayside and then trash the main thing Wayside is known for? You know, to an extent I can get cutting the student count down, that's not unreasonable. In a 45 minute film, you've gotta be conservative with the time and budget that you got, I understand that. But if you're gonna cut them down to begin with, the least you could do with those remaining students is make them the tiniest bit relevant, right? I'm not saying they've all gotta have their own personalized character arcs, just at the bare minimum to maximize their involvement, let there be more than four students who get to say or do anything. That's literally something the book was able to accomplish with five to six page chapters. There's no excuse to make that much of the cast so irrelevant, especially when the guy they give all the screen time to is the most bland type of character you could possibly have when introducing a wacky setting. The fish out of water transfer student who doesn't get the weird rules of Wayside, but wants to fit in. Like, I'm sorry, excuse me, sir. Did you get this guy off the back of a fucking printer? Cause how else could you come up with something this copy-pasted. They literally had 28 options, 28 fully realized characters to choose from. All the work done, all fun, all memorable, all not generic as hell and showing way more creative means of demonstrating the school's weirdness. And they decided for the main character of their opening story to come up with a new one that's actually not new at all because he's been done a million times in every guy who's different goes to a new place story ever. I mean, I guess it's cool they flipped the usual tropes you'd expect, making it so the new New kids the normal one in a school full of weirdness so yeah that's kind of fun but still out of all the stories they could have done to introduce wayside a series known for its stellar characters and creativity they had to have had better than the ones that sidelined most of the cast for the adventures of the writer's cookie cutter straight man oc oh and i don't want to hear anything from people going hey but wait i thought he was from the books since yes his name is todd and he does have the same gimmick as the book character of the same name but aside from that they they've got no relation. For example, Book Todd was interesting. Okay, but seriously, the original Todd actually was a really unique character with a funny gimmick. His whole thing in the books was that he was smart and thoughtful and nice and fair, but in spite of that, he was also the worst at reading the room, so he was always the main kid who got in trouble. He was a character founded on tragic irony, the type who always thought before he spoke while the other kids fought and screamed, but spoke out loud by accident when he shouldn't have while they knew when to shut up. That was Todd. And if he were the lead, I would have been genuinely intrigued to see how they'd go about it, but unfortunately he's not. This imposter is. Though, then again, calling him that would imply he stole Todd's identity or something, when nah, like I said, they're nothing alike. The only things they have in common are that they both get in trouble without intending it and, well, are named Todd. That's it. Whoever this guy is, he's a new character. Simple as. And he's a boring new character. One whose whole boring straight man existence can be boiled down to him yelling and pleading with everyone to notice they're in a trash compactor for 45 minutes straight and them not listening cause they're all dumb. I, I mean weird. And weirdness impairs your hearing. Obviously. Oh, and Mrs. Jules will send him home early on the kindergarten bus for trying to warn them, seeing as she's just, you know, a moronic asshole. Sorry to be mean, but wait, no I'm not, that's just a fact. Mrs. Jules fucking sucks in this, even more than the rest of the class who are all dumb and hearing impaired. And the main reason for why is that, as opposed to the books where it was Todd's fault he got in trouble, and if it wasn't, he'd get back at the one who framed him, here, she just writes him up for doing nothing wrong. It's almost intentionally random. And when it isn't, it's usually a result of her doing that same thing where she tunes out most of what he says while trying to help. So yeah, either way, she just comes off like an annoying bitch. I mean, obviously it's going for a sort of comedic approach where I guess you're supposed to be 
I don't know, excitedly waiting to see what new things she'll find to punish him for. But what makes it hard to watch is that while Todd didn't seem bothered by getting marked up and riding home early in the books, in this, he's super noticeably uncomfortable and horrified. He does not want to be there. Like, he, he literally begs and pleads her not to do it. So her constantly punishing him for things that shouldn't get him in trouble isn't as much charmingly dense as it is legitimately unfair and not to sound like a stereotype of my community here, but it's true, weirdly mean-spirited. Todd never does anything to deserve this kind of treatment, and he's the only one who ever gets it purely for trying to help. So regardless of if she's doing it out of ignorance or what, he's still a victim who never gets back at the authority figure that more or less bullies him for existing. It's like if Crocker from Fairly Odd Parents was supposed to be likable for giving kids Fs. She's basically the antagonist of the film. I mean, you know, not that there's a lot of competition, it's just, you know, between her and the trash compactor. You know, I'd like them to do a collaboration where she gets crushed by the trash compactor, if you know what I mean. But the film itself treats it like she's cute or something for doing this when she's not. There's nothing endearing about her stupidity here, it's just frustrating. You want to know about someone whose dumb moments made you love them more? Then let's look at the real Mrs. Jules, because she is a charm magnet. And a big part of that does come from how she's a bit clueless. After all, her introductory chapter is about her thinking the class are too cute to be kids, so they must be monkeys. She isn't always on top of the game, and the main recurring way that's demonstrated comes from how she treats Todd. Not that she's unfair or singles him out, she just can't pick up on anyone but him since he's so bad at not getting in trouble. You can tell it isn't her fault, and seeing as Todd's never personally phased by it either, there's no reason to get mad. It's just a charming mistake. No harm, no foul. In fact, it's explicitly stated that Todd considers Mrs. Jules the nicest teacher he's ever had, and him thinking that isn't hard to believe at all when you understand what type of person Mrs. Jules is. Like, sure, she isn't always the brightest, and occasionally her logic is flawed, but whenever she messes up, it always comes from genuine human error or a real earnest desire to help. And most of the time when she does help through teaching lessons, she's shockingly profound. Like how the value of art isn't determined by its quantity, but the time and effort you put in, or that love can be given to as many people as you want without it ever depleting. Or if you want to be important, it's not the clothes that make you, but what's underneath, so you should wear expensive underwear. It isn't hard to see why she's a teacher or why everyone, including Todd, loves her despite her flaws. She isn't perfect by any means, there are lots of times she slips up or can't handle things, as humans do, but what makes it forgivable is that she never does anything to hurt the kids who don't deserve it. And in the one instance where she does without meaning to, she sends herself home early as a punishment. How can you not love that? She's so wholesome and kind, you'd want her to be your teacher, unlike the film version, who's totally unlikable and in the end, never apologizes after Todd's proven right about all his screaming, you know, that <laughs> they're in a trash compactor. She and the film itself just move on from her behavior without so much as a sorry, so Todd can say he wouldn't change a thing because, you know, he's so bonded to everyone despite the fact that he, he didn't t talk to any of them. Uh, but uh, what about the way Mrs. Jules treated him? Todd, you're not gonna complain about that and all the suffering it caused? All right then. Oh, but I forgot. That's another part of the school's weirdness. And Todd doesn't want to change the weirdness for reasons, so it's fine. But do you know who actually would like to change the weirdness of Wayside? Me. I would. Because this thing doesn't get what made the book so unique and fun in their approach to weirdness at all. If anything, the weirdness of this movie is, ironically, the most generic type of weird you can do. The rules have no meaning given to madness type of weird where everything's goofy and over the top and nothing makes sense, so you gotta take things as they come. Which, don't get me wrong, isn't inherently bad. I'm not hating on stories like Alice in Wonderland for taking that approach. It's just that one, they don't do anything interesting with it in this film, and two, it's quite literally the opposite of what Wayside was all about. They were the books where the most insane shit could happen on a day-to-day -day basis, but everything about how that shit worked always made a weird type of sense. Like, for instance, in one story, the character Dana gets tons of mosquito bites all over her body, so to get rid of them, Mrs. Jules decides to turn them into numbers. Literally. She has Dana add up the bites using arithmetic, and by answering right, she physically turns them into numbers, getting them off her body. You see what I'm talking about? It's a logic that comes from playing off common ideas and sayings, in this case the idea of solving problems by turning them into numbers, to essentially tell a joke subverting your expectations. And Sakura does this one a lot to great effect, like, why does Rondi get complimented for the cute front teeth she doesn't have? 
because it's the fact they're missing that makes them cute. What does Mrs. Jules do when she's told her classroom is playing music so loud nobody can hear? She has them play louder so everyone can hear. And listen, I could keep going if I wanted to. These books are full of creative wordplay that makes for some fucking genius puns. The only reason I'm moving on is because the one thing that rivals the creative logic of Wayside is how many different ways soccer finds to keep it interesting. Another more common trick of his I enjoy is when he makes stories with fantastical elements that are based in grounded metaphors. Like when Mrs. Jules creates ice creams flavored after all the students so Mauricia can give them a lick to see who she likes, but the one flavor she can't taste is the one flavored after her, since it tastes like what Mauricia tastes when she's tasting nothing. That's taking the creative metaphor and giving it new purposes beyond the metaphor. Of course, there's also the really paranormal stuff, like the building just not having a 19th floor, usually, where the logic comes more from how it works than how it exists, since it's just understood and accepted as a part of the world, which are always fun. But I gotta say, my favorite bits of weirdness in Wayside are probably when Soccer uses the logic of traditional book conventions to confuse you as a reader. Like writing a whole chapter backwards to put you in the mind of a girl who hears the end of a story first and reads it in reverse to be surprised. Or when the class brings in their pets and nothing seems to make sense, using the lack of a visual element to say funny things until at the end we learn what those pets' names are and it all comes together. Which I love specifically for how they don't stop at making jokes or creating concepts in universe, but actively challenge your logic as a reader to understand it. This is what I was talking about when I said these things are everything a kid could want out of books, because how many novels have you read that turned the act of reading itself into a game? That's awesome, and it's a great show of just how creative a writer Soccer is. He knows how to get the medium to work how he wants it to, both in and out of text, all while presenting it in a way that the readers can figure out if they just think like the Wayside Kids. It's undeniably some next level imagination and style. So getting back to my point about how the film handles weirdness, I think you can understand now why I'm so fed up with its, frankly, uninspired ass. There's almost nothing about its version of weirdness that's anywhere close to being as creative or thorough as the books, or fuck, even uniquely its own. Characters with wacky personalities? Seen it. Unprompted spasms with no logic? Seen it. Rules that make no sense but are just sort of there to be weird? Seen it. Copy-paste straight man fish out of water who doesn't get the weirdness but wants to learn? Oh baby, you better fucking believe I've seen it. Everything about this film creatively is just a massive glut of overused ideas with flat executions. But the part I've seen before that pisses me off the most has got to be when it tries to pretend it's like the books by doing its own takes on their iconic jokes and bits without knowing shit about why they're funny. You know, it's actually kind of ironic. They were probably inserted to be like, see, we read the books, we're the same. But in reality, I don't think there's any easier way to show how different they really are. Like, remember how I mentioned Mrs. Jules was introduced thinking the kids were too cute to be kids, so they had to be monkeys? One of the book's most basic chapters when it comes to demonstrating how they think? Well, in the film, they do their own version of this by having Mrs. Jules mistake Todd for a monkey when he shows up. Oh, were you... Were you waiting for me to say something else? No, no, that was it. No setup, no reasoning. Just, whoa, she called Todd a thing that he is not. That's most unusual, yes. It's pretty much the equivalent of having a punchline without telling the rest of the joke. Otherwise, you're just spitting out catchphrases. And hey, man, this movie does like its catchphrases, so it lines up. But still, it leads to so much wasted potential, including when it comes to the one, count them, one idea this film had that the books didn't, which potentially could have fit into them and their style of weirdness if done right. The layout and functionality of the school. Now, in the books, aside from missing a 19th floor sometimes, and what else being built on its side, Wayside, as far as we could tell from a layout standpoint, didn't really matter. There were occasional jokes about its impracticality, like how it's missing an elevator and the bathrooms are on the first floor, but that was pretty much it, since the books aren't about why the building is weird, they're about the antics of the people inside. It'd be missing the point of what they're doing to focus on Wayside as a school, like making Game of Thrones about the throne. It's almost comically dumb. However, on the other hand, to talk about its prospects, I do also think you could play with the thought of how a traditional school could get messed up structure-wise being built on its side. Granted, it could just as likely open the door for lazy gags with no thought, <clears throat> but there is promise in the concept, and at a couple points in the film, they just about almost almost get there. It's actually insane how close they are to almost resembling the books while still just falling short due to their lack of thought. Take the couple times we see a classroom that just inexplicably has a short roof. That could be a funny joke with the right logic, like maybe one of those intended rooms was a high ceiling storage closet or something, so by getting turned on its side, it became a small room that the school tries to use normally. That'd be a waste idea, even if it's not quite as bizarre or clever as the books. And I sort of wish that was the case just to give 
give this movie some semblance of credit because I almost feel bad at this point, but that's clearly not the joke of these scenes. The floor itself isn't small or cramped, there's just a single room that happens to be short with a small door so they can tell the joke that haha, rooms should not be small. How wacky. Bazinga. And that's what they do for every detail of the school. It doesn't feel like the logical result of a builder messing up a layout, it feels like it was designed by MC Escher with lockers on the walls and doors on the floor and a bunch of other design choices that weren't put in with any thought beyond XD it's so weird. There's almost zero attempt to tell jokes using the setup. And you know, even if you wanted to argue for its merits outside of being an adaptation here, like the book shouldn't matter and we should count the movie's weirdness on its own, I'd still say the school is wasted potential since if they weren't following rules and could come up with anything, why is it so basic? You had all the options in the world to trick out this school with rooms that defy common sense. And the best you could come up with was, what, a 30th floor that got mixed up with a garbage disposal and turned into a giant trash compactor? Big fucking whoop, the walls move. You're hardly stretching your creative muscles here. If you're gonna shove aside most of the class to put heavier emphasis on the school, then the least you could do is make the school interesting. I wanna see some infinity train shit. Give me a floor that's nothing but chrome reflections trying to switch places with you, or one that's shaped like a map with a miniature sea and islands and everything that's also a classroom somehow. I don't know how it's supposed to work, that's your job. You want me to believe anything can happen? Be outlandish. Nothing's stopping you from doing more but your own weak imaginations. There shouldn't be this much nothing to chew on. Hell, the only times I can say this ever did something genuinely weird and out there were when the class size, student count, and seating order changed in almost every shot without ever pointing it out. Uh, though then again, that might have just been a flaw of the animation, which is inconsistent, to put it lightly. I think the effect they're trying to go for is something cartoony like the Spongebob movie, where the characters can go off model for the sake of funny expressions and all that, but what it doesn't seem to get is that what made the Spongebob movie work was it was on model most of the time, so when they really pushed the expressions for certain shots, you could tell it was on purpose to accentuate a joke. Whereas here, the characters basically never look the same for more than a couple shots, so it ends up coming off as less like a creative decision, and and more the result of a small budget giving them less room to fix shots that don't look right. And yeah, this absolutely reeks of low budget. You can practically smell the penny pinching. I mean, it is still a TV movie, so it's got a few upsides here and there. We see a good couple of backgrounds, there are some fun transitions, one or two fluid looking money shots, but God, that's barely enough to make up for all the consistency issues, especially on the characters. Just pay attention to any single one of them from shot to shot and you'll know what I mean. Sometimes their proportions are stocky and short, other times they're lanky, their iris sizes and details constantly fluctuate or disappear, way too many shots forget to draw certain parts of their bodies during crowd shots, every once in a while their outlines will be oddly thinner than usual, or just a single character's outline will be thinner, I'm not sure how that happens, and then there are the moments that just look wrong. I don't know how else to put it, they look wrong. Like, why does Marisha have a gradated effect on her cheeks here when the colors are always so solid and thick? Why does Mrs. Jules look like that for a second and quickly go back to normal? Why do they tween the kids walking up to the window here without moving them closer? It makes it look like they were all at the window from the start and just slowly bobbing up and down. Oh, also Steven's hat and a layer of his hair go missing for over a second, can't forget about that. My but by far the scenes that have it the worst are undoubtedly when the trash compactor almost crushes the class. Oh dear, there are so many moments to choose from here. I could point out how many shots have 12 seats when they're supposed to be 15, the times when 10 or less kids are in frames that should cover the whole class of 14, the way the wall is constantly almost covering the doorway and not even close to it when we cut back, there's this shot and that shot and this one and that one, oh and that shot looks really bad, how did that get approved? But the crown jewel of all the bad shots here has got to be this one. Holy shit, this looks terrible. You got the 12 desks and lacking student count, every one of their movements is timed on a six frame loop that repeats four times a second, the details are way too minimal for how long the shots last, and I don't even want to go into what's wrong with the perspective, it's no. And okay, I know what you're thinking, Braxton, why are you getting on this movie's ass for these less than great shots? Every film has moments that look bad, yeah but this one actively forces me to notice them. That shot 
shot I just talked about lasts for six full seconds. Six! That's 24 loops of the same animation before cutting to something else. They hold on it, man. And also keep in mind all the shots I talked about are from the same general scene. I didn't have to go looking to find these. They're everywhere. It's not a matter of the film not being perfect. It's a matter of it having such obviously wrong, uncanny scenes that happen way too frequently and go on for way too long to be brushed off as minor hiccups. I'm genuinely curious if there was anyone around to supervise and check things with just how many blatant errors there are all the time. It feels straight up unfinished. I don't know what was going down at Nelvana Animation at the time. From what it looks like, they seem to take on a lot of projects with varying levels of quality, usually outsourcing parts of the work to other studios, so maybe that's the reason? But also, this was apparently made fully in-house according to Wikipedia, so I don't know. I guess it's thematically fitting that the explanation for why it's like this is a total mystery, just like all the other weird shit about this pilot. Hey, why have explanations for things when you cannot? Or who knows, maybe it was just the studio didn't care as much knowing this was a prototype for the full series coming a couple years later. And hey, giving the benefit of the doubt here, maybe that's the reason for most of this film's problems. And if it isn't, it was probably just a first time crew getting used to the characters and setting and all that. I'm sure that in that time between the movie and the show, the creators must have taken into account feedback, made the necessary changes, tried to get everything tighter, and just kidding, it's worse, let's get into it. Alright, so first things first, now that I'm moving on to the problems I have with the show, I want to start by establishing just how different those problems are going to be from the ones I have with the film. Since while they do keep the same cast, setting, premise, and so on, making you think they'd probably be pretty similar in terms of issues, they're honestly really nothing alike. And it's all because the show completely changes the overall focus. See, in my section on the film, I didn't say much of anything about the plot being that, well, they're barely was one. But to sum up the events of the film, it's more or less just Todd coming across weird things around the school and reacting accordingly. Like, the main narrative through line is him trying to prove the walls are moving and they're in a giant trash compactor, there are scenes of him traversing the stairs, messing with controls, trying to fix problems around Wayside, it pretty much goes all in on the school itself being the focus, whereas in the show, they basically drop that idea, only having it take center stage in four, technically five segments, and switch that focus over to being more about the rest of the cast. Oh, but don't get it twisted, I don't mean the rest of the cast as in the rest of the class. No, 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 they stay in the background to get fuck all. What I'm talking about are the other minor characters introduced in the pilot. Dana, Myron, Mauricia, Miss Mush, Lewis, and Principal Kidswater. You see, I didn't bring it, them, or anyone else in the side cast up while discussing the pilot, seeing as they were so insignificant there was no reason to, but it was actually fairly clear from the start that Wayside the series was never gonna stick to the book's anthology method whatsoever. Why else would they get rid of most of the class and keep a majority as glorified extras for the whole movie? It was obvious. Todd was always meant to be the lead, the three students were always meant to be his little posse of friends, and the teachers were always meant to be the remaining side characters. No one else. What, after all that, did you seriously think they were going to keep a defining element of the books that helped them stand out? I thought it was pretty apparent by now that this crew paints in broad strokes and only brings over the most basic features possible to be considered Wayside. That's why all these characters just keep their names and a gimmick from their book counterparts while otherwise being nothing alike. This crew didn't have the guts to go for anything more than your average unremarkable wacky kids cartoon, so they just used Wayside and its weirdness as an illusion to destroy from how boringly safe it is. Remember, they chose to make the fish out of water straight man the protagonist. They're not looking to be ambitious here. Although on that note, while I'm talking about Todd again, it is strange how they chose him as the basis for the lead when you take into account his gimmick. Oh wait, I've said that word twice now. What do I mean when I say gimmick? Well, a big thing soccer did to help each individual student stick in your mind was that in addition to their regular personalities, he also gave a lot of them little traits or behaviors that were usually important to their respective stories. Joy was a compulsively lying kleptomaniac, Paul couldn't stop pulling Leslie's pigtails, the Eric's all acted differently but got grouped together for having the same name, etc. Of course, it was never what made up their whole characters, at most being the basis for stories that expanded on their actual personalities further, but they were the bits that helped you remember, all right, that's what's-his-face. It was basically Soccer's way of giving the cast consistent, recognizable features since you couldn't see them physically. And so, having said that, no 
knowing the show discarded everything but those features when making the new cast, what do you think Todd's gimmick must have been? After all, this is the main character, our POV for a majority of the show, so the crew had to have picked a trait that was at least fitting for the new role he's gonna play, right? And, uh... Being charitable, they kinda did if you just mean the movie and nothing else, but for the full show, it's a terrible idea. And that's because Todd's gimmick is that he never makes it to the end of the school day. That's his thing. He goes back to what I said before about his conduct, you know, he doesn't try to be bad if he can help it, but no matter how good he is for most of the day, he'll always get three strikes and go home early on the kindergarten bus. Now, like I said, this trait kinda works for new Todd in the film, since it's about him getting used to the weirdness as a new student, so him getting marked up and going home so often, as annoying as it is, does help demonstrate his otherness, not understanding the culture, and failing to fit in until the very end. In a way, you can even see it as a thing he needs to beat to show he's become a true waysider, with him avoiding it to save the class and then giving into the weirdness, symbolizing how he's no longer an outsider. From that perspective, I can see why they chose Todd and his gimmick for the lead. However, if you keep that gimmick going into the show, doesn't that undo his whole quote-unquote arc from the film? I mean, it's never been very clear if he had an arc whatsoever. He kind of just went from not understanding to understanding it, but isn't that subtextually saying he never really became a waysider and still hasn't learned enough to avoid getting punished for nothing? That's a pretty succinct way of undoing his progression, if you're asking me, especially considering how to keep the gimmick going in the show, they theoretically should have had him keep going home early in every single episode episode, he's the star. Now, do they commit to that bit? Not even a little. Of the 20 segments he plays a big role in this season, Todd only goes home four times. It's actually kind of pathetic how rarely it's done. But still, the fact that they bring it up like he does go home every day definitely implies he's not in tune with the weirdness. And why would he be? If the writers did that, they wouldn't have a straight man anymore. And if they didn't have a straight man, then how would the audience know how wacky everything is? Their whole system would come crashing down, and God forbid these guys take chances. Chances. When this crew is given the chance to step out of their comfort zone, they do the logical thing and build a brick wall around it. What else would they do? So yeah, Todd gets to stay the straight man protagonist for the rest of the show. Although admittedly, he does change in one way, and that's by losing everything that made him watchable as a lead. Like man, if I didn't make it clear before, I wasn't all that fond of Todd in the movie. By all accounts, he was really boring. But I'd take the upbeat, wanna be helpful, take things as it comes Todd any day over the sometimes personalityless, other times pest pessimistic wet blanket he's turned into. And I'm telling you, it all comes down to attitude, as like I've been saying, his actual role in the narrative hasn't changed all that much. In both versions, Todd is the guy who doesn't get all the rules, contemplates if he's fitting in, and generally plays the voice of reason, trying to fix Wayside's problems, usually to his detriments. All that's changed is that in the series proper, he's more done with everyone's shit and willing to speak his mind. There's not the same naive optimism or shyness he had before, and aside from being less charming, making him come off like a total nag, it also really highlights how stale the episode formula is, seeing as it's literally just the parts of the movie where he tries to tell them the walls are moving. Almost every time it's just the same thing of class or side character does something dumb slash illogical. Todd tries to correct them or points out their behavior is dumb. They either misinterpret his statement, punish him, or act like he didn't say something at all. Todd sighs and reluctantly saves the day or gives in to the madness, usually with the other three. It's so insane repetitive, and there's only a handful of times Todd isn't constantly nagging too, like, wah, 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 you guys are so wacky and weird, why can't you be normal? It's exhausting. Not that he's in the wrong for saying it, the rest of the cast are incredibly irritating, but he ends up saying it so many times, I started getting pissed at him too just for being so predictable. And when that's how tolerable your straight man is, you know the rest of the cast have gotta have some serious problems. Now, same as Todd when it came to the film, I thought the side cast were fine. Like, obviously I just liked Mrs. Jules, and I still don't like her here, as she's basically stayed the exact same. Real ones never change, I guess. But the others were at the least inoffensive. Naturally, they weren't even close to their book counterparts, or even a third as interesting, but really at this point that's just me being redundant. As characters on their own, they were acceptable. Nothing groundbreaking, I've definitely seen their archetypes done better before in other shows, but they could have been worse than they are.
And that's what their show versions are. Yeah, that's right. Somehow in those two years of development, instead of getting better with time, these guys got worse. And the simple reason for why is that they all had one aspect of their personalities exaggerated to an annoying degree. At first, Dana was your average excited nerd who liked organizing, but now her whole life is defined by following rules. Myron was the typical overconfident doofus running for class president until he became obsessed with power and in general being a terrible person. Mauricia was... Okay, she was always kind of basic in her one-sided tsundere crush on Todd, but my point stands, they've all been simplified to hell. And I haven't even gotten to the worst one yet. Principal Kidswatter. Fuck, I cannot stand this guy anymore. I already didn't love his film version since him being an outwardly insecure man-child missed the point of the books where the joke was that he looked intimidating and cool but made constant stupid mistakes, but here? His stupidity's just gone too far, man. It's gone too far. At minimum in the film, he was still clearly an adult who hated kids, being that his name is, you know, Mr. Kid Swatter and all. But here in the show, he's become so dumb and out of touch with reality, there's literally a running gag that he doesn't know what the students are and calls them little people out to get him. At least sometimes. Yeah, the joke isn't consistent. Nothing in Wayside's first season is, but it's enough to tell you his whole character's been sanded down to nothing but dumb weirdo. And it's a bit that gets worn out super quickly with how often he ends up leading B-plots, which, by the way, are pure filler if I've ever seen them. They all go on for one, maybe two of those 11 minutes per episode tops, and every time, it's the same goddamn thing. Either Kidswater gets a new thing and fucks around, or he gets the wrong idea and fucks around. It's never got anything to do with the story, he's just there to be over the top and wacky purely for the sake of it. And in general, I think that's why they've simplified the cast as much as they have, to emphasize their zaniness now that they're more important. After all, they're taking the spotlight away from the building's weirdness, so I suppose the crew figured they had to change where the weirdness was coming from. And hey, I'm not against that idea conceptually. I'd like to see more avenues for them exploring weirdness. It's just that, well, first of all, the only ideas they've got for being weird are making the cast super ungodly oddly one note, turning them into bland caricatures of themselves, and secondly, in making them so basic, the staff are getting rid of the bits that ground these characters as being human, something that might not seem like a big deal here, but was essential to the book's weirdness being as memorable as it was. You see, an interesting thing about the cast in the books is that they have weird traits, but they don't feel like weird people, at least not in the same way as the show. They don't feel like cartoon characters. There aren't any quirky catchphrases or car-flipping tantrums to show how wacky and weird they are. No, they're just average kids you've probably met at some point in your lives who altogether feel like real, fleshed out people. And that's what helps their specific brand of weirdness stick out so much. Because it doesn't come from them being zany and over the top, it comes from them being mostly down to earth but having strange logic that sticks out. Like you're not gonna find a girl skating up the school and cutting down a satellite that's too far from reality, but you will find a girl who, when she grows the front teeth she's always complimented for not having, thinks that to stay cute, she has to get someone to knock him out and ask around for any takers. Now, if the wacky cast of the show did that, it wouldn't have any bite, since they're, well, wacky cartoon characters, them doing dumb shit and getting hurt is expected when their detachment from reality is already so high, but Rondi is a mostly down-to-earth kid, as are the rest of them, so her making this weird request with weird logic and everyone going along with it like it's normal feels uniquely weird in a way the show never could, thanks to the contrast. It's intentionally made to have a big impact without needing a big setup, and it speaks to a level of thought Soccer had when writing the books that the show staff simply can't comprehend. To them, being weird isn't contrast or bending logic or proper setup and planning, it's screaming and madness and everyone being as dumb as a pile of rocks 24-7. It's exactly why the show has a straight man like Todd while the books don't. They don't need one. To say something needs a straight man is to say the world's too alien for a viewer to jump in without him. It assumes we need some sane, normal person like us to navigate this mysterious setting and have its wacky customs explained through exposition. But in the books, we already understand the world since its logic and concepts are made to work off of ours, and the characters are totally sane. They just see things through a different point of view. Like, have you ever stopped to ask why we think the kids in the books are weird? Because it's not from how nonsensical what they're doing is. A majority of the time, we know exactly why and how they think like they do. It's just that their thinking is shaped through a world that works differently from ours, which we see as the basis for normal, so to us, their thinking is weird. It's all 
all a matter of perspective. That's why the books have such a deadpan, matter-of-fact tone and humor. To us, it comes off like a comedic contrast to the wackiness of how they act, but to them, there's nothing wacky about it. They're just acting how they normally would. If anything, we're the weird ones for not acting like them. Why don't we ask people to knock out our teeth to stay cute, or read stories backwards when we hear the end first, or try to sell our toes when we can't find a use for them? That's how the logic at Wayside works, so if we can't think like them, then we must be weird. But we're not. And neither are they. And that's why the books don't need a straight man. Their cast is already normal. We can understand them perfectly. You just need to look at them from a different angle. Perhaps a 90 degree angle. Eh, eh, you, you get it? Cause, cause, yeah, fuck you guys, you get what I'm saying. When Wayside's characters are done right, they don't need a straight man. So the fact the film needed one before, and the show definitely needs one now to stop it from being pure, off-the-walls, unexplained insanity, says way more about how badly they've been massacred than words ever could. But you know, that does also raise an interesting question. Are there any characters in Wayside that don't make a mockery of their book selves, don't get worse from the film to the show, and aren't one-dimensional or utterly brain-dead? You'd probably think the obvious answer would be no, but surprisingly, yes, there actually is. Believe it or not, one character from the books isn't fucking terrible here. His name is Lewis the Yard Teacher, and all it took for him not to suck was ruining the crucial role he played in the books. Oh, sorry, was that less positive than you thought it would be? Well, now you know how I feel. God, this whole situation pissed me off. Okay, so in case you're unaware, Lewis in the books is the best. He's one of the most likable characters, go figure, for the offer self-insert. And a big part of what makes him so likable in the first place is that he's the only adult in the series who can give advice to the kids while speaking to them on their level, which is a role that's super important to have since it gives the kids someone older they can trust when they don't know who to turn to. See, Mrs. Jules is obviously a nice person who gives profound advice just as often as she does bad, but at the same time, you can also tell she doesn't quite think the same as the class. She has an adult's mindset, and a lot of the time that leads to her either getting fed up with how they act or not knowing how to handle issues without using her authority. It's not that she's a bad teacher, there's just a disconnect between her as an adult and them as kids that Lewis bridges as the art teacher. A job that's by all means meant for adults, being that he's a chaperone during recess who takes care of the equipment, but aside from being one of the lesser jobs a teacher can have, putting him closer in power to the kids than basically anyone else at the school, it's also a job that lets him act like a kid when he wants to. There isn't that same mental barrier between him and the class like there is with Mrs. Jules. They can play together, joke around, keep secrets. It's like Lewis is a kid himself, just bigger. And that means the cast always have an adult they can talk to or ask for help without being intimidated, since he isn't just an adult, he's Lewis. The guy who seems to know everything in the world when you ask him. The guy who has power and uses it right. The guy you can count on to understand what you're going through. Lewis was that guy. But now, he's just some guy, he's barely around, which sucks extra hard considering he had one of the bigger roles in the pilot and was by far the least annoying part. Like on the negative, I wouldn't say he was the best adapted, you can't do a proper Lewis without his mustache, that's like Santa without a beard, and I'm not sure how I feel about the surfer bro personality either, but as far as his role in the plot, he isn't bad. It goes without saying he only ever speaks to Todd since no one else in the film matters enough for him to help, but still, just having a human who was down to earth that listened to Todd and tried to help when asked, instantly made him the most likable character bar none. I was cheering whenever he showed up. Lewis was everything to me. And what's more thematically speaking, he also had a pretty interesting connection to Todd and how they were both trying their best to help the school despite the incompetent people working against them. I mean, it's never stated explicitly whether that's the intention or not, so who knows, maybe it wasn't. But I always thought that connection was why the two hit it off so easily at the start, by just having a similar wavelength about the problems of the school that nobody else can see. Now, that would have been a fun direction to take the show. Having Todd try to fix the problems of Wayside like he did in the film with Lewis as a more experienced mentor accustomed to the weirdness, I'd watch that. But eh, now I'm just writing a fan fiction. I'm not even describing Wayside as a concept anymore. Should probably tell you a little about where my mindset is right now. But anyway, my point is, Lewis was a decent character who didn't suck, had something resembling a dynamic with Todd, was tolerable being on screen, and was basically the only character anywhere close to his book counterparts. He was the one thing you could argue the show was doing right on some level. And so of course for the full series, he almost got removed entirely. Not to say he was erased from the timeline or anything, Lewis still exists as a character, and a couple times he makes cameo appearances outside the two episodes this season and five overall where he's important to the plot, but 
let me repeat, he only stars in 5 out of 52 episodes. That's less than Miss Mush, a twice per book background character who got turned into an old female version of Rolf from Ed, Ed and Eddie. Lewis is less important than old lady Rolf. He's gone from the guy everyone trusts to just the chill janitor that helps out sometimes. And while I could at least accept that if he made like Miss Zarves, Bob the Hobo, Mrs. Franklin, the men with the attache case, Dr. Pickel, Miss Walouche, Mrs. Drazil, Mr. Gorf, Wendy Nogard, and half of Mrs. Jules class by just not appearing anywhere else, meaning he wouldn't be any more disappointing than the rest of the cast, it's made ten times worse by how we get to see a decent version and then he just stopped being important. Oh sure, the kids act like he's the book character when he shows up, saying he's beloved and makes everything better with his presence, which, you know, I agree, but, uh, what presence? He's barely above background status. He doesn't do shit. You know what this show did? It cock-teased us, straight up. No ambiguity about it. They gave us a little taste of the goods, let us have some fun for a second, and then boom, they snatched it away just to let us know they could give it to us if they wanted, but they're not gonna. And so to that I say, fuck you, Wayside. I swear, the only bigger blue-balling they do than this is when we finally get something even slightly deeper and for Okay, so I've got no idea what happened between seasons one and two and why it only lasted for the first three episodes, but this short period before it went to Flash is by far the show at its most tolerable. Like, obviously compared to most shows, it's still hardly anything special. At best, it's maybe a five out of ten on a good day, but God damn it, that's more than sufficient after all I've been through so far. What's the difference? Well, a couple things, but most importantly, the cast. Particularly the other students in Mrs. Jewel's class, who, after a full season, of doing nothing, saying nothing, and never being relevant to a single plot, finally, do things. Granted, it's not a lot, they never get to be the primary focus or lead of any episode, and they don't get anywhere close to the level of depth they had in the books, and aside from whittling down the class size, they've also been whittled down to misinterpretations of small bits about them from their introductory chapters, like John always standing on his head when his whole story was about him not being able to do that, and the Eric's being a collective when theirs was about how they weren't anything alike. The Fuck, dude, they do things. They say things. They have the ability to communicate and affect the story. The plots are centered around including them and their characteristics on some level instead of just sticking them in the background. That's more than they ever had in season one or the movie. It's almost like they're an ensemble cast for once, as basic, shallow, one note, and underutilized as they all are. I know this is literally me getting excited over the bare minimum, but the bar's been on the floor for too long for me not to. Be. It's a marked improvement, if anything, even if it just exposes new problems that didn't exist before. And the same can be said for what's done to the main cast, who aren't nearly as bad as they usually are. Todd especially. You know, up till now, I've been getting on his ass a lot for being a sucky, generic lead who takes up loads of screen time that could have gone to the rest of the class. But here, it seems like all of those things were taken into account and at least somewhat corrected or solved. Like, for one thing, thankfully, he's not nearly as predominantly on screen only staying the focus in two segments and giving way more time to the ensemble, but more crucially than that, when it comes to his flaws as a character, he's also just way less annoying overall. They got rid of that dumb thing where he feels the need to point out every small trace of weird, taking back most of what made him such a dull straight man in the first place, so without that to lean on for his personality, he ends up finding a whole new defining trait in being logical, and I mean obsessively logical, to the point it often consumes his reasoning and inadvertently makes him do things that are almost illogical. It's a very paradoxical type of thing. And surprisingly enough, with that setup in mind, the writers actually use it for some kinda okay plots and gags. Like him having a hero who's all about logic, who's colorless because he only sees in black and white. I laughed at that, that's a good joke. I wouldn't say it was great, it's not the books, but it was based on logic and wasn't just a catchphrase or being dumb, which is more than I can say for most of the show's writing. So yeah, I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed Todd, in these episodes. Not that he's all that amazing either, really he's only just barely above the level of fine, but after 13 episodes of him doing the same shtick over and over, it was nice to see even the smallest hint of variety. In fact, that's exactly what's done to make the whole cast decent here. They're not quite as locked in to their predetermined roles. There are episodes where Dana isn't just rules, where Myron isn't obsessed with power, where Mauricia's more into sports than she is Todd. For once, it's not quite as predictable what types of stories they're 
gonna get into. I know, Wayside not being predictable? How fucking shocking! I mean, it's still got a long way to go before it's anywhere close to being unpredictable, let alone weird, or dare I say it for fear of sounding repetitive, like the books. But again, to reiterate, bar on the floor. I'm barely even trying to talk about it as an adaptation or on its own merits anymore. I'm mostly just comparing it to the first season, since that's the only way I can be positive. Cause no, it's still not like the books. No, it's still not memorable. No, its weirdness still isn't unique. No, its concept isn't any less wasted. No, the cast still isn't remarkable. No, it's still not that funny. No, it's still not consistent. No, it doesn't deserve the name Wayside. But... It's the best it's ever gonna be. And god fucking damn it, I want to savor that cock tease knowing that after this point, it just ends up reaching a whole nother low. However, having said that, while these episodes are definitely the worst part of the show without a doubt, the interesting thing about their actual content is that, well, they aren't interesting at all as episodes. In terms of content, for the most part, all they do is revert the cast back to their season one selves, make their annoying defining traits even more exaggerated than before, and throw in the other students a little more often to show that no, these aren't just old scripts that got repurposed to finish the show now that the budget's been cut and the animation switched over to Flash, they just decided to start a season two was a little too decent and had to end extra shittily to balance it out. There is almost nothing of note to say about these episodes that I haven't said before, so why is this getting its own section? One reason. This part of the season is the only era that centers some episodes around other classmates, of course while still keeping the main four as the main part of the plot, and those episodes demonstrate how even if this cast were more fairly integrated or, god forbid, allowed to be the protagonists of their own episodes, it wouldn't make the show any better since, fundamentally, the show writers aren't Lewis Soccer. They aren't trying to build a large, fleshed out cast of three-dimensional characters with loads of depth or memorable personality. Shit, they can't even do that for their main cast. All they ever wanted to do was use Wayside as a Trojan horse for their unremarkable, wacky kids show. And these episodes featuring the kids who've been in the background till now are the best way I can show how because when the staff were given the chance to do something more with them, to let us know what these guys are beyond their one no gimmicks, we got episodes that were pure nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because there never was anything to see, was there? The main cast, they all probably existed as characters before the Wayside paint job. They just got gimmicks and names grafted on to feign that connection. But these guys? They didn't have any personalities of their own to begin with. They were only around for the purpose of pretending the show was like the books when it never was. That's why their whole personalities are based off misinterpretations of little details from their introductory book chapters. That's why every joke made with them is exactly the same with no variation. That's why they didn't do anything during the film or throughout all of season one. They were never anything. At the start of season two, it wasn't quite as obvious since they were playing bit parts that fit their non-existent characters, but now that they're all out there, through episodes that show these characters were blank slates with nothing to them from the start, we can see what they and this show always were as adaptations. Nothing. The characters are nothing, the weirdness is nothing, the nuance is nothing, the world building's nothing, the school is nothing, the identity's nothing. And as a show on its own, it's incredibly boring, forgettable, basic. So why not stop watching it for a while and pick up a book instead? I've got a few suggestions to start you out. They're creative, unique, wild, surprisingly deep, funny, and above all else, worth your time. I've been Just Stop, coming at you with a continually getting hoarser throat. You've been abiding by the wayside, and thanks for watching.